Hello, everyone, and welcome to your very first lecture of epidemiology. I'm Dr. Rati Jani, and I'll be your convener for this unit. I'll be giving you a bit, bit more introduction about myself in the tutorial, uh, where I'll be giving you a broad overview about what I'm doing, where I come from, and what is this unit about. So all of that is covered in the tube. And part of your tube is also um, online, live, where you'll be meeting me on um, the Blackboard Canvas platform. But uh, let's just get directly um, into the lecture for the lecture content. And we'll be having a bit more of interaction um, in your tutes, right? All right, so what we'll be covering today is measuring disease frequency and standardized rates. Before we get started, please make a note that there are a couple of blue slides in um, some of your lectures throughout this unit. And these blue slides are not part of any of your assessment items, but uh, they are additional knowledge to help you um, advance your understanding in epidemiology. All right, so rest assured they will not be um, they, you won't be having questions popped up in any of your assignments from these blue slides, but please do review these blue slides for your own understanding and knowledge because as a postgraduate student, the intention, yes, should be about gaining good marks, which is important, but about gathering as much knowledge as possible because that is what is going to help you in your real life. All right, so that's why you have these certain blue slides um, across various weeks in uh, specific lectures. Okay, so yes, um, in this lecture as well, you will have a couple of blue slides. And when we come to that, I'll again remind you that don't worry, they are not part of any assessments, but uh, please do review them because they help to increase your knowledge in EPI. Okay, so let's get started. So yes, uh, your learning objectives are that by the end of this lecture, you should have a broad overview about measuring disease frequencies, standardized rates, and you have a post reading item, which is understanding uh, various global health indicators. All right, um, so what are the real life applications of this? Now, this is important. I try to do this in my lecture as much as possible to give you the real life scenario of what you're learning today. How are you going to be using this in real life? Okay, in your job or whatever you, you do in your career, which is related to um, research, because as you know, EPI is the foundation of research. So if you were to do research in the future, the first subject that you should be studying is EPI because it provides a good theoretical overview about research. And then you actually go into practice and application via your um, specific research projects. All right, so yes, the real life application of what you will be learning today is uh, what you will learn today will help you understand and read your research articles better, be this governmental documents or say original research articles, um, so yes, for instance, if you had things like 300 infants that under one year of age per thousand live birth, you will actually understand what this means after this lecture, all right? So you will have a better understanding of um, reading, comprehending and interpreting research data, governmental reports, so on and so forth. Yes, uh, statistical uh, interpretations will improve because when I uh, tell you something like these are age standardized mortality rate. So after this lecture, you will have a understanding of, okay, I know what age standardization means. I mean, I know this term, I'm familiar with it. I know in what context it is used. Okay, so you will have an understanding of that, for instance. And of course, uh, epidemiology, it helps you prepare yourself for job interviews, especially as I said, if you are planning to work in the space of research. For instance, if you apply for a research assistant position, having these basic understanding is very important. All right, so this is what I'll try to do in as many lectures as possible, which is to give you a real life application of what you're studying, um, how it's going to be useful. Okay, so I hope um, um, you like this and you appreciate um, the importance of connecting your learning objectives to real life applications. All right, so yeah, now measuring uh, disease frequency. This is what we are going to start off with first. So yes, uh, we will be uh, going over, uh, we'll be having a broad overview about epidemiology, just a very broad overview in your tutorials. Uh, so the part of the tutorial, which is recorded, uh, will be um, having this overview in uh, that, where uh, you will be understanding, and I'll just repeat myself over here, is that what is the goal of epidemiology? 
the goal of epidemiology is to yes improve the um, health and well-being of the population because epidemiology um, tries to uh, focus from preventative terms first ep epidemiology wants to prevent a disease from happening of course if it's already happened then epidemiology focuses on treatment and management but epidemiology starts right from prevention and this is what epidemiology tries to do, which is improve the health and well-being of the overall population. How do you improve the health and well-being of the population? By reducing morbidity and mortality. So uh, what do you mean by morbidity and mortality? So morbidity is um, sickness. Okay, so any sort of disease condition, be it acute or chronic. Type 2 diabetes, morbid, morbidity. Then if you have coronavirus, acute. All right, so even that accounts for morbidity. Mortality, as the term suggests, is death, all right? So that's secondary to disease, for instance, or um, any other um, condition, but mortality refers to death, whereas morbidity refers to a disease condition. So this is the aim of epidemiology, which is to improve the overall health of the population. How do you do that? By reducing morbidity and mortality. But now the main question is, so how do you reduce morbidity and mortality, all right? So first, to reduce something, you need to um, understand you need to capture the scenario. How do you capture the scenario? By quantifying it. So one of the methods to um, say address uh, morbidity and mortality is to first quantify morbidity and mortality, which helps you to capture the scenario, understand, okay, this is what is happening in the population. Maybe there are so many infants death, or maybe there is a, uh, a lot of um, say moms who are dying of sickness, etc. So for you to capture this, you need to quantify your uh, population of interest. All right, so that is the first step towards, say, identifying um, the solutions. To identify solutions, first you need to understand your population, capture what's happening in the population. One way of capturing is by quantifying uh, the issue in your population, okay, the morbidity and mortality numbers. All right, so yeah, this is a, a very broad overview about what um, EPI is. And as I have um, emphasized, um, you will be having um, more um, of a broader overview in your tutes where I, uh, the one which is recorded, which will give you a broader idea of um, what is the overall scenario of epidemiology, okay? All right, so first we'll start with measures of morbidity and then we will go on to measures of mortality, okay? So we'll start with morbidity. So yes, disease frequency, um, it can be uh, measured in the following ways. There are two most important ways in which um, you can say quantify or you can understand or you can capture um, morbidity is via prevalence and incidence. Okay, so these are the two main important terms in terms of morbidity. So now uh, just uh, let me give you a one quick real life example, then we'll go to the mathematical calculations. Uh, and rest assured um, students, um, these calculations which uh, we will be um, say discussing in this um, unit are not very complicated, okay? So rest assured, it is not that they are so complicated that it's um, going to uh, make you nervous and you're going to be worried, no. They are pretty simple uh, calculations that you will be practicing throughout the unit um, where applicable because as I said, epidemiology is more about understanding the theory behind research, okay? So there is a lot of theoretical context, but wherever possible, I have tried to give you real life applications of the same so you understand why you're studying this. It's not a waste of time, but it has some importance. Okay, so yes, prevalence and incidence and all of the rest what we are covering in today's lecture. Uh, this has a lot of calculations, but they are um, relatively easier calculations. The ones which are very complicated, like calculating advanced, um, say, eight standardized rates, for example, these are not accessible items because these are advanced level epidemiological knowledge. It is not, um, it is not appropriate to um, ask you to do those calculations at a unit which is gearing you um, to understand the basics of epidemiology. All right, so don't worry. Okay, so uh, now let me give you an example of uh, prevalence. So for instance, currently, um, so this is a real life application. So currently I am doing a systematic review and meta-analysis with my um, colleagues, both senior and junior. And what we are trying to look at is the association between vitamin D deficiency and uh, CVD events. CVD is your cardiovascular events. Now these events are of two types. They are um, say morbidity events and mortality events, meaning individuals who are having vitamin D deficiency, 
and they are dying because of CVD. They are vitamin D deficient and therefore they are at high risk of say death because of CVD events. Okay, so that is the association. So see how we are trying to measure uh, mortality in real life. And morbidity includes, um, yes, the individual is vitamin D deficient and they are at high risk of cardiovascular events, okay, but non-fatal. That's why they are morbidity. They are not um, dead as of now. Okay, so um, basically this may include, for example, having say um, a heart attack or um, say, um, um, say having atherosclerosis or say having hypertension, all of these are your cardiovascular events. Okay, so now over here, in terms of morbidity that we are trying to study in this meta-analysis, one aspect what we are trying to look at is all of those studies in which individuals are recruited who already have the disease condition. This is called as prevalence, okay? So in my real life meta-analysis and systematic review, which I'm doing, I'm looking at uh, one of my sections of my um, meta-analysis research is to look at all of the individuals who already have the disease condition and then they are recruited in the study, okay? So for instance, um, say all of this participant population, they may be recruited from hospitals, okay, um, as outpatients because they have been admitted to this hospital, uh, say maybe 12 months back or even say two months back be because of a heart attack which they had and now they are coming for follow-up and maybe I'm recruiting this participant population, all right? So in my meta-analysis, I'm looking at prevalence-based studies. Prevalence-based studies meaning the disease has actually occurred. Okay, so this is what the definition means over here for you. Prevalence is what proportion of the population actually has the disease at a specific time point. Okay, so for me, it is any study with, of course, my parameter, which is vitamin D and its association with CVD, because that's my main research question. Any study in which uh, participants already have the cardiovascular event. Okay, and uh, which means the non fatal event. They are not um, dead as of yet. Okay, so please don't find it rude when, I, um, when I'm saying it in such colloquial terms, meaning like they are not dead at the moment and things. I'm not uh, trying to be rude, but um, I'm trying to um, be as simplistic as possible so it is easier for my students to understand. I'll just orient you to my learning and my teaching styles as well. So it's um, not, uh, you don't find me off-putting that, oh, she uses such terms. No, if I were to speak to a professional audience, of course, I would be speaking in a very different manner. But my entire intention over here is that my students should understand the content well. And that is what my, um, my honesty is, like, you know, to convey it in as simple manner as possible. Okay, so now you understand what prevalence is. Now there are common types of prevalence. The three main most common types in research which is used is point prevalence. So what is point prevalence? Proportion of population has the disease at a specific time point. Okay, so for instance, uh, people currently having the flu. And I've just used the um, year 2019. This could be any current year which you are studying, like 2021, for instance. Okay, so yes, people currently having the disease condition is called as point prevalence. Then you have period prevalence. What is period prevalence? what proportion of the population has the disease at any point during a given time period, all right? This could be, say, within the past 12 months, um, say, um, COVID cases, for example, in the last 12 months, or it could be, say, this time span could be really big. So, for instance, in my meta-analysis, which I'm doing, the period prevalence, I'm looking at period prevalence. Why? Because the time frame is, say, in the past one year to past 10 years. So, that is my bracket. So, um, any study which is looking at individual already having the disease condition in uh, from the past one year. So like, you know, the individual is actually suffering from the CVD disease because of a vitamin D deficiency for at least a minimum of one year to 10 years. Okay, so one to 10 is my period prevalence. Does that make sense? Okay, that is my time period. Okay, then you have lifetime prevalence. So lifetime prevalence, meaning what proportion of the population had the disease at any point um, in their life. Okay, so it could be, um, maybe um, say 15 years back, an individual had a heart attack, okay? And that individual is eligible for the study, all right? But as I said, for example, uh, because I have defined my, and there are various reasons as to how and why you define a research question, which of course we won't go into all of the details, but 
For instance, in my meta-analysis, I'm looking at period prevalence, meaning if they are sitting between one to 10 years, then they are part of the meta-analysis. Does that make sense? Okay. And what is a systematic review versus meta-analysis? If I'm using these terms and you're unfamiliar, rest assured, this is covered in your coming lectures. So um, don't feel overwhelmed uh, thinking, what is meta-analysis? What is she talking about? No, this is a type of say, study, um, um, a type of study uh, which you would be doing and the types of study and study designs, these are covered in your coming lectures. All right. Okay, so now this is the formula for calculating prevalence. And as I said, I have kept the calculation as simplistic as possible. There are various ways in which you can um, do one calculation. All right, students, so please be mindful about that. I have shown you the most simplistic way possible. Okay, and of course, when I even ask you in your assessments, I will be giving you such examples, meaning, for instance, I'll be giving you a small little case study like this, and then I'll be asking you to uh, calculate. So I will assess you in the manner I have taught you. Okay, so that is important. That is what I'm trying to say. Okay, you won't be having um, just say a random table and I'll be asking you, okay, from this table, calculate the prevalence. No, I I, this is uh, what I have taught you. So this is how I'll assess you. Okay, of course, if you want to advance your knowledge further, you're very free to look at the um, recommended textbooks and learn various other techniques of calculation. But otherwise, this is um, one of the techniques, the most simplest technique which I'm teaching as part of this unit because I'm gearing to the larger audience, all right? Because some students, they come back to me and say that, oh, but I have learned how to calculate the same thing in a different manner. Of course, absolutely, you are right. Um, and there is nothing wrong about it, but uh, feel free to use whichever method is comfortable to you as long as the final answer is the same. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, this is uh, the one which I have showed you over here. So for instance, the um, formula for prevalence is total number of people with the disease at a given uh, time point divided by total number of people in the population at the same uh, time point. So now what does this mean? Let's look at the example that makes more sense. So for instance, you have done a survey of a sample size of 1,150 women. Okay, so that is your total sample size. Who gave birth in the Canberra hospital, for instance, in April, 2020? A total of 468 moms from these 1150, from this big sample size, you had these 468 moms who reported taking multivitamin supplements at least four times a week during the month. Okay, so now in this, calculate the prevalence of frequent multivitamin users in this group. So you see how this is a mini case study and then I'm asking you to calculate from that. So um, I'll be um, giving you an assessment item in which you have the same sort of a thing. You may have a different case study and then I may ask you to calculate prevalence out of it. So does that make sense? Okay, so that is how um, I'll be, um, whatever you're learning, that is how you will be assessed basically in short. Okay, so yes, your numerator over here is six, um, 468 and your denominator is 1150. You divide it and um, multiply it into 100 and then you get 40.7, all right? So the prevalence is generally reported um, as per hundred or thousands or 10,000s or hundred thousands, okay? So the prevalence of um, frequent multivitamin user among this population is 40.7%. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, this is a very simplistic example and the most simple way of calculation. As I said, the essence of this unit is for you to understand where is the supplied? How is the supplied? Things like that. So that is why I gave you a real life example of meta-analysis to show you that within a real life data set, within a study which I want to perform, this is how I'm like trying to look at prevalence um, in real life scenario and trying to categorize studies accordingly, which then I'll be using for analysis, okay? All right, so now we go on to the concept of incidence. So now let me take the same example, the vitamin D1, because um, I'm looking at both type of study designs in that, all right? So now with the vitamin D example uh, and the meta-analysis, um, just a refresher, yes, uh, my research question is, individuals who are vitamin D deficient, are they at a greater risk of say CVD events? Okay, and the CVD events could be morbidity-based and mortality-based. Now you know what this concept means, morbidity and mortality, all right? So now again, incidence is an indicator of morbidity, all right? So now I'm trying to, one um, section of my studies, as I said, I'm trying to look at all of the studies in which um, individuals already have the disease, which is prevalence, okay? Now I'm trying to look at these other cohort of studies 
in which individuals do not have the cardiovascular event but they are vitamin d deficient okay because that is my main independent variable of interest what is your independent variable dependent variable again this is covered in your future lectures but just as an fyi over here your vitamin d is your independent variable and the outcome what happens because an individual is vitamin d deficient is your dependent variable which over here is cvd events okay so now in this second section i'm trying to look at all individuals who are disease free all right they do not have the disease condition which is cvd event they have been enrolled in this study okay and then maybe after uh, you maybe say even after one day or maybe after say 10 days or 10 months or one year or 10 year they then have the disease condition but now this is called as incidence because it is newly acquired disease condition within that time period okay so that is what your definition stands over here as well what proportion of the population newly acquired the disease during the given time period okay so this is the thing so now for instance um, so as you can now appreciate how is this concept applied in real life i'm doing a meta analysis in which i'm seeing um, all those individuals who um, already have the disease and what are their repercussions on cvd events all individuals who newly acquired the disease during the course of the study what are their repercussions on uh, say the uh, mortality risk which is or morbidity risk the cvd event okay so i hope that makes sense guys as to how these concepts are applied in real life of course you will be hearing these uh, terms incidence and prevalence a lot in epidemiological paper this is particularly done the type of study designs where you will see this is a lot is in say prospective studies prospective studies are longitudinal studies all right so my meta analysis which i'm doing for instance a vitamin d1 i'm looking at only prospective cohort studies prospective cohort studies are studies which are done for a longer duration okay uh, so for instance the study may go on for one year or 10 years or 20 years all right for instance the average when i calculated of the prevalence based studies um they are around 5 years okay and where um the average which i calculated of the incidence based studies in my meta analysis they were approximately 11.5 years okay because as you may appreciate that if someone has newly acquired the disease during the course of the study it may be likely that uh, they have a longer life span or duration in terms of mortality is what i'm talking about before they hit the end point the end point over here could be say cvd uh, death because of cvd all right the uh, mortality mortality all right so yes so um, as you may appreciate that um, yes for longitudinal studies you will generally see incidence and prevalence rate calculated where else you will see this you will see this as a lot in governmental documents all right so for instance uh, when you when you and me do studies which are say uh, more smaller in nature cross sectional studies and things we really do not have to do these calculations by hand all right uh, but if you are working with very large governmental data sets like for example you have collected data of all individuals in australia and you want to find out that how many individuals have developed diabetes in a particular year okay incidence all right so for instance you know how you have the um, statistics of one in five people in australia are diagnosed with diabetes every 5 minutes or something like that okay so this is your incidence newly diagnosed with diabetes those sort of biostatisticians and epidemiologists those people actually do this calculations by say various softwares etc okay so but um, how is this applicable to a researcher like me and yourself in the future who may not be working with say big governmental data sets these are called as large data sets okay would be where you are taking various other studies and where you are trying to synthesize information from that study in say in form of systematic reviews and meta analysis all right or else yes of course if you are doing a clinical research for instance uh, for say one year and then you may have patients who are uh, develop this disease condition during the course of that one year in which you can use these simple calculations so i hope um, uh, you can appreciate how this is the, how these concepts are applied in real life okay so i hope this has been helpful now how we had common types of uh, prevalence similarly you have the common types of incidence the first one is the incidence proportion all right or it's also called as the cumulative incidence or attack incident attack rate what this means it means that the proportion of people who develop the disease 
or become injured or die or at a risk of getting a disease during a um, given time period. Okay, now please understand with this that um, when I say or, or it, because it all depends upon the research question. For example, my research question is looking at both of the things. People who develop the disease during this period. Okay, my meta-analysis is looking at how many people are developing, say, um, CVD event during the study period? That is, I'm, I'm actually interested in incidence proportion. Okay, so my meta-analysis is interested in incidence proportion, and that is what we are gathering out of the papers. Okay, but we are also looking at how many people will eventually die because they develop this disease condition during the course of study. Okay, now these studies uh, could be cross-sectional or could be um, longitudinal in nature. All right, so they are just looking at a snapshot. Generally, they are cross-sectional in nature, but bear in mind, they can become longitudinal in nature when you include time as a factor. Meaning, um, for instance, the studies which we have um, selected for the incidence to report incidence of vitamin D and CVD, a lot of researchers have said that 20% of their population died in the second year of the study. Uh, then 30% of the population died at the seventh year of their study. So now you see how time factor is included in the picture as well. Uh, um, say second uh, in the second year of the study and seventh year of the study. So when you have time in the picture, this becomes the incidence rate. Does that make sense? Okay. So you have the incidence proportion which is much more simplistic. It is more cross-sectional in nature. What is cross-sectional? Again, it's going to be covered in your coming lectures. Okay, so yes, incidence proportion is much more cross-sectional in nature, whereas incidence rate is much more longitudinal in nature because it has time as a factor, all right? So I hope that um, is uh, the distinguish is, it can be easily distinguished, the difference between incidence proportion and incidence rate, all right? So yep, moving further. Now let's look at a um, example of calculating the incidence proportion versus incidence rate. All right, so now you have, for example, if you have 10 participants, so just um, look where my mouse is hovering. So you have 10 participants in your study, okay? I haven't specified um, number of males and females. Yes, it could be anything. This is a hypothetical example, okay? And basically you want to look at the effect of coronavirus uh, vaccine um, on patient recovery, meaning these people um, already say maybe have the disease condition over here, which is coronavirus. Now, what is the incidence over here? the recovery rate is the incidence, okay? It is not the disease condition is not the incidence. Please understand, all of these people already have the disease, which is coronavirus, that is not of our interest. What is of our interest in terms of incidence is, at what time point do people recover from coronavirus, okay? So this is how incidence is defined. See, this is what I'm saying, that incidence definition can vary a lot depending upon the type of your research question, all right? So for your, the recovery rate is your incidence rate. Whereas some people may want to study at what time point people developed coronavirus, um, say in 2020, okay? So that is a different type of study and a different type of research question. So over here, please understand, we want to see all of these people already have um, COVID, which is not of our interest. What we are interested in is that when do they recover from this disease after taking the vaccination, all right? So we have 10 people in the study. In simplistic term, all 10 of them have COVID all 10 of them are given the COVID vaccine, okay? And now let's see the rate of recovery, which is our incidence, okay? So we have three people who recovered in week one, nobody in week two, one person in week three, and three more people in week four, okay? So we have in total seven people who recovered. Week five was the deadline. If people had to, they should recover by week, week five. But unfortunately in week five, nobody recovered, but there were three people who never recovered meaning they kept on having the COVID vaccine or um, COVID virus, okay? So they were COVID positive even at week five and beyond. Does that make sense? So basically this researcher wanted to see within this five week, do people recover um, after taking this uh, vaccine or antidote? Antidote would be much more better. Vaccine is more preventative in nature. Antidote would be much more better in this case, okay? The terminology, I mean. All right, so I hope this makes sense. We have 10 people, seven of them have recovered after taking the vaccine or the antidote, okay, we have three people who haven't been recovered. Okay, so now how do we calculate incidence rate and prevalence rate from this example? So now calculating the um, incidence proportion, all right, not prevalence rate, sorry, incidence proportion and incidence rate. So first we are calculating the incidence uh, proportion IP, 
Okay, so we know that we have a sample size of 10 people. We know a total of seven people have recovered. So seven divided by 10, all right, 0 0.7. If you, um, when you want to make it into a decimal, you multiply it by 100. So what you can say is on an average, 70% uh, people recovered from coronavirus after taking the vaccine or antidote in a five week period, okay? But if you see it has not taken the time unit into calculation, meaning three people recovered in say first week, it has not taken any of the time unit into calculation. So basically a lot of studies which uh, we have in the meta-analysis, uh, a lot of them, um, they only report the incidence proportion, meaning we had 70% of people die um, in our study. But they don't say, was this in the first year, second year, third year, what was happening? It's just a very cross-sectional snapshot. 70% people died in our study from CVD uh, who were vitamin D deficient. That's it. Okay. So something like this is your incidence proportion. Okay. Um, then you have incidence rate. Um, okay. So what is your incidence rate? Uh, what is the calculation? Calculation is person into time. Okay. So this is person into time unit. And the unit for time in this case is weeks because we had five weeks, okay? So this unit of time can vary. It can be months, it can be minutes, depending upon the type of, say, the study, um, what the study is trying to capture. Okay, so yes, you have a person into time as unit. Time over year is week in this case. Okay, so yes, the main difference incidence rate has, it takes the time unit into calculation, all right? And it is um, very much used when you have a comparative group. So for example, you have, Maybe you have two antidote. You know, like how you have even the uh, COVID vaccine, you have uh, two companies who are doing this. Um, I'm sorry, I again uh, cannot uh, pronounce the name of those companies when it's, it's, it's for and the something else. Okay, but yes, you have two companies who are doing this, right? Um, so if you want to compare uh, the recovery rate um, or the risk of not getting the COVID virus in the future between these two companies, that is when incidence rate would be very useful. Okay, so in uh, say real life, that is how you can put it into application. So yeah, so for instance, now you have um, say three people in first week, and this is what we saw in the earlier slide. If you don't remember, see, it's this one. So we have three people recover in first week. This is what this means. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So three people in first week, one person in the third week, and three people in fourth week. And we had three people who did not recover at all. Okay, so they are also accounted for over here. All right. So then you um, do this calculation and then you get 33. Okay, so you can do it by yourself and uh, you can uh, check it and review it. All right. Um, so yes, then you have 33. And we already know that seven people in total have recovered. Okay, so you have seven divided by 33, which is your denominator over here, 33, uh, which gives you 0 0.21. Again, to make it a percentage in 200. All right, so now this is reported in a very funny way. Okay, so person years or person weeks or person months. That is how it is reported. So it may sound very funny. It is not something which we use in our general practice. So it's um, difficult to say, get the lingo of it. But as long as you understand the concept, which is good. Okay, so yes, you have 21.21 people per 100 person weeks. Okay, so that is how it is reported in person weeks or person months, or whatever it is. The unit over here is 100. So yes, that's why it is 100% person B. Okay. It could also be reported in 1000 person years or a person months or person weeks, depending upon the number of people in your study. This is in hundreds. Okay. So um, yes, I hope this is clear. Again, I hope the calculation is simple enough for you to understand and comprehend. All right. Okay. So now the relationship between incidence and prevalence. You may have cases in which you have increased incidence and you have increased prevalence. Okay, so for instance, if you um, remember the um, say era in say maybe it was in the 50s um, or 60s where smoking was considered really cool and uh, it was not uh, very much the understanding of smoking causes cancer was not um, really understood, the connection between the both. All right, so you had increased incidences of um, say individual. Um, say developing um, cancer and then the prevalence of cancer. So individuals having cancer for a prolonged period of time related to smoking, but people did not make this con um, connection. But this is when you have an increased incidence and you have an increased prevalence, okay? Uh, but then you may have the other case where you have increased death and decreased cure. This is your typical COVID case, all right? Where you have 
because um, say in 2020, we did not uh, discover the COVID vaccine. It was all under investigation and research. We had such a high um, number of people dying uh, because of COVID because there was um, say no cure identified at that time, no vaccine identified, all right? So this is the case. Uh, so I just wanted to show you that how uh, both concepts are interrelated to each other. Now let's look at specific cases in terms of disease condition um, and uh, morbidity. So now let's look at um, acute condition, acute disease condition, all right, case one. So for instance, over here, now we have say, um, let's just hope that this is the scenario. Of course, our COVID vaccines have just started and we'll see the benefits of it in the coming future. But in a hypothetical, hypothetical um, say situation, let us assume that um, now you have COVID vaccines and this is a 100% cure, there is no looking back. So in this, you will have increased cure. Of course, um, so you do not have people who are getting COVID anymore. So yes, increased cure. You will have decreased prevalence automatically. You will not have a lot of um, cases who already have COVID because now that number is decreasing. All right, you will have decreased incidence also. Not many new people are developing, um, say, COVID because they have the vaccine, all right? And there is decreased death, obviously, because there is a cure, okay? So cure and death are opposite related, all right? So when you have decreased death, it is because you have an increased cure. And in acute cases, you will also have incidence going down and prevalence going down, all right? So this is an acute disease condition. Now let's look at chronic disease conditions such as type 2 diabetes, all right? So now in this health condition, how is the concept of incidence and prevalence related? Over here, we know that uh, the cure for type 2 diabetes, there is no cure as such, but I've just used cure in terms of epidemiological concept. But uh, we know that diabetes is managed via insulin and by oral hypoglycemic agents, OHGA, okay? So yes, we know that we have learned how to manage type 2 diabetes and to help individuals and support individuals to live their life with type 2 diabetes. So you can say this is the cure. It is not actually a cure. I hope you appreciate it. But um, basically, this is, um, say, um, the management of type 2 diabetes. So because now we have the management of type 2 diabetes, um, would you have an increased prevalence or constant prevalence? You can have either cases. You can have prevalence being constant throughout the years or else you may have an increase, all right? So for instance, when um, I was doing my postdoc um, in Wulindali Shire, so this is a small little um, town at the outskirts of Sydney. It is in Campbelltown area. Um, so over there, what was, in, of course, we know that we have insulin and the oral hypoglycemic agents for management, but you could see that the type 2 diabetes prevalence rate was increasing throughout the years. Why? Because of many, many other reasons. Uh, because there were no, um, say, tertiary hospital for, say, management of complex diabetes cases and um, uh, no endocrinologist, say, available in the Bulundari Shire. So there were such reasons as to why there was an increase in prevalence rate. Okay, so this is what I'm saying. Even if you have a management, um, say, plan, you may have conditions in which you have an increased prevalence rate or else, say, um, in a place um, where uh, you have good management and the individuals have various other resources to manage their disease, you may have the prevalence rate being constant as well. Okay, but um, you may not have, say, a decrease as such, you may not see a decrease as such because diabetes, as you know, and you can appreciate is not curable, okay? We don't actually have a cure for it. We manage it. We don't have a cure for it. So it is not like um, COVID where you take the vaccine, you will never get COVID. And that's why you have a decrease in prevalence and incidence rate. That may not happen with diabetes. Right now, you don't know what the future holds. Okay, so similarly with incidence is the same thing, which is you may have a increase in incidence rate, like how we saw in the Bulundali Shire, Willardley Shire had an increase in incidence rate every year and an increase in prevalence rate also every year, okay? But as you can appreciate, it was because of various other conditions, like no endocrinologist, no tertiary hospital, so on and so forth, okay? So yes, uh, over here, you can have an increase in incidence or, a, or else a constant, constant incidence rate. But because you are managing diabetes, definitely the death because of diabetes has decreased compared to, say, in the 30s, uh, where there was not really a good, say, diabetes management plan in terms of exogenous insulin availability and oral hypoglycemic agents. Okay, so does that make sense? So yes, that has decreased, but uh, you may not really see uh, a change 
in terms of prevalence and incidence, they could be constant or they may increase. Um, and we have to appreciate why this is the case because you do not have a cure as such, you are managing your chronic disease conditions, okay? So, yep, it all really depends upon the disease condition and the population of which you are investigating the question that these, um, say, uh, scenarios may change, okay? So yes, prevalence useful for measuring chronic diseases. So yes, prevalence is a very um, useful, say, um, variable which we use for measuring chronic diseases. And chronic diseases are which diseases which are for a longer duration, which do not have a cure, okay, and which have a high disease burden. So you have, um, it cost the healthcare sector a loss, it cost the hospitals a loss, um, say um, $6 billion a cost um, per um, annually, for the management of diabetes. So that's a big um, healthcare cost incurred and service-based incurred on the health service sector in Australia, okay? So yeah, for that prevalence is very uh, useful to report, okay? So, and look at this YouTube video, which gives you a very good overview about what I explained um, regarding the relationship between incidence and prevalence, okay? All right, now we go on to the measures of mortality. So we have covered morbidity, all right? So morbidity, as I said, the disease condition, incidence and prevalence. Now we are looking at mortality, various ways of quantifying mortality. So first one which you have is the crude mortality rate or crude death rate. Okay, so now in this, uh, basically what it means, the mortality rate from all causes of death from a population, all right? So the formula over here is total number of people that have died during a given time period divided by total number of population in the same time period generally reported in thousands and hundred thousands. So in the UK in 2013, so this is again a case study, a mini case study, for instance, a total of these many people uh, death had occurred, okay? The estimated population was this much, okay? So it's very, very simple. So you have the total number of uh, people who have died during 2013 and the total number of population in 2013 into your 100,000 because you want to report it um, per 100,000. So there are say 832 deaths per 100,000. Does that make sense? This is very simple calculation, as simple as it can get to um, quantify crude mortality rates. All right. And um, um, just the FYI students that um, throughout my lectures, you will see that um, in, in couple of PowerPoints, um, in lot of PowerPoints, I have additional say notes and explanation um, at the bottom of the slides. So that is just to tell you that uh, probably where I got this information apart from the textbooks that have been used, um, for instance, and um, any further examples which are there or something which is going to add more information to the slide, those are there in those say footnotes of the PowerPoint slides, okay? All right, so now you have cause specific mortality rate. So this is when you have the mortality rate from a specific cause um, in a population in a given time period. Again, very simple calculation. So if you look at the formula, total number of people that had to have died during a given time period from a specific uh, cause divided by total number of population again. Again, it is reported in thousands or hundred thousands. So in the UK in 2013, again, this is that mini case study. The estimated population was so much, a total of um, so many people died because of motor vehicle accident. So if you see the difference over here, over here, I'm interested in how many people died because of the motor vehicle accident in 2013. So the same thing remains, which is your uh, numerator being number of people died because of motor vehicle accident, total number of population, and then multiplied into 100,000 again. So you have 37.2. So it is 37.2 per 100,000 was the uh, cause specific mortality rate secondary to motor vehicle accidents in 2013. All right, so again, I hope the calculation is simple. It is as simple as it can get. These are not very complicated calculations. So I hope um, it's um, simple enough. The number of infants under one year of age, all right, under one year of age that have died in a given time period and divided by total number of live births in the same time period, okay? Generally reported in thousands or hundreds. So you have, for instance, again, this is hypothetical, uh, 1,300 infants dead in 2008 within Australia. And you have so many live births, all right? Um, live births, um, oh, um, over here, I can see um, my mistake. It should be the same time period. So 
my apologies, um, students, I have created this hypothetical example, right? So I should have my numbering right. So yes, please um, excuse me for this, okay? So yep, so you have say 1,300 infants that in 2018 within Australia, and within the same time period, 2018, you have so many live births, okay? So again, you have the same simplistic calculation, divide the numbers in 2000, because this is reported in thousands, all right? You have 8.7 infants dead per thousand live births, all right? Um, in 2018 within Australia. So I hope this makes sense. Again, um, not very difficult to um, comprehend, okay? Then you have maternal mortality ratio. So now again, um, this um, has a very uh, detailed definition. So if we look at this total number of deaths of women during pregnancy or during childbirth or within 42 days of termination of a pregnancy in a given time period, all right? Divided by total number of live births again within the same time period, all right? So now if we see 84, for example, a uh, case study example you have, for instance, 84 maternal deaths in 2018 within Australia, all right, during pregnancy or during childbirth or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy, all of this together, 84 maternal deaths. Then you have so many live births in Australia in the same year. You divide it into 100,000 100, and then you get 64.6 .6 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births, okay? So, yep, yeah, um, so I hope this is um, simple and easy and it is reported in hundred thousands, okay? So I hope this is easy to understand and comprehend. And as you will appreciate uh, students again, that this is generally um, reported, as I said, when you're doing large scale big data sets. And now you know what big data sets mean. Big data set means when you're looking at say large governmental, national, international level data set is when you generally calculate these things, okay? But of course, for instance, if you're working for Queensland government, ACT Health, you may be looking at these numbers in a smaller, uh, say, format, which is, say, within ACT or, say, within the Canberra Hospital, what is the maternal mortality ratio? That also could be the case. Okay, but generally, this is reported when you are looking at big data sets. All right, so now let's look at the theoretical concept of standardized rates. So yeah, the theory behind standardized rates, um, what are standardized rates? They help you to compare morbidity and mortality between two or more populations. So it is very important to understand the term standardization. So when in epidemiology and in statistics, epidemiology and statistics go hand in hand, okay? They are uh, two sides of the same coin, all right? So in epidemiology or statistics, when you um, say standardization, this means you have some sort of a number, some sort of a variable, which you can compare across studies, okay? So if I have done a study in Australia and I have cal calculated standardized rates, I can compare this with uh, say uh, the same standardized figures which are reported in UK and in Africa and in India, China, so on and so forth, okay? So that is what we mean by standardization, meaning you have this number, which is uh, which you can compare across various population across various research studies okay so yes it helps you to compare morbidity and mortality between two or more population why because it's a standardized unit then comparison of crude mortality and morbidity rates what is crude mortality all of the things which we saw till date right now regarding mortality all of those are crude numbers, okay? They are not standardized numbers, all right? So they can be often misleading because the underlying characteristics of the population may differ. So the crude mortality rates, which we have studied until now, morbidity rates that we have studied until now, these can be quite misleading because they are not adjusted for confounding variables, okay? Now, what are confounding variables? You will be learning that in your coming lectures, but basically, for you to say standardize something, you what does this mean? In say simple terms, what standardization means? You know the applicability of standardization, which is you can compare across population. All right, now what the term standardization means in simple terms is you should be confident to say that irrespective of the person's age, this is what is seen in the population. Okay, so when you can say irrespective of some variable, that is called a standardization, okay? So meaning after controlling for age, this is the death rate in India and China. After controlling for um, age, this is the incidence of um, say 
substance abuse disorder okay so it could be drugs alcohol narcotics anything okay but yes after controlling for age this is the incidence of substance abuse disorder in say um, globally okay so this is what i mean by standardization you should be able to say that after controlling for something this is what is reported across various studies but please be mindful when we talk about standardization over here you can only control for a few confounding variables the most common ones which are controlled for are age and gender okay and even among age and gender for instance age is generally used uh, to say compare or describe mortality say controlling for age then describing mortality rates between population for instance okay but uh, yes you cannot control for all confounding variables um and report no that is not possible within uh, the calculation of the standardized rates for you to control for various confounding variables and to see if something is associated with something that requires some other kind of statistics okay but uh, what we are talking about right now is just very descriptive in nature okay it is very um say one variable in nature like you just want to know death rates between various countries okay after controlling for age so you are just interested in one variable death rate um between various countries and this is control for age okay but your variable of interest is just death rate okay so um, yes so basically when you just have one variable what is most commonly controlled for is age and gender when you have when you are trying to identify the relationship between two or more variable for example death rate and say um you can say death rate and um, say type 2 diabetes okay or yeah my thing like vitamin d and death rate because of cvd okay so in this you uh, can control for many many variables in specific statistical models okay uh, which are like regression when you have two or more variables over here understand when you are talking about standardization it is very uni variable in nature you are describing one variable of interest it could be say incidence or prevalence or morbidity mortality of one specific variable okay most common things which are controlled for are age and gender all right and now you know the concept of standardization what it means meaning you are confident enough to say that after controlling for age this is what the scenario is for instance and you know the applicability of standardization which is you can compare this um, say between populations okay there are two types of standardization method the most common types which are direct and indirect direct method very importantly is used uh, when you have a reference population when you have a indicator population then you use direct method of standardization okay and it is generally used with large uh, sample size therefore for example you want to see cancer rate across countries direct method of standardization okay um then you have indirect method this is used when you do not have a reference population available okay so no reference population indirect method is used and it is also used in the cases when you have a very small sample size all right uh, why because uh, with small sample size you have greater uh, say um risk of type 1 type 2 errors all right and um, yes yeah, that's why uh, with this indirect method is a good thing to do all right and what are type 1 type 2 errors again you will be learning about this in your coming lectures all right so yes um, because when we have very small po populations and we compare this to say very big um, say uh, reference population this can give you incorrect findings okay because the uh, characteristics of, of the small sample size population very can be very unique and you cannot generalize this to larger populations but yes what does this mean i'll be explaining all of that in coming lectures okay so uh, yes so right now just bear in mind that direct method used when you have reference population large sample size indirect method used when you have you do not have a reference population and you have smaller sample sizes for example cancer cancer rate between new south wales and act for instance okay okay so um yes this is something which i um covered with you um, earlier is what is the usefulness or application of standardized rate as i said the terminology suggests that it is standardized meaning you can say irrespective of age this is the scenario of say mortality because of um say overdose of drugs between various countries okay so uh, you have you are standardizing it for one or more variable all right and that's why it is a standardized figure all right then i'll show you an image in the next slide okay but um over here just um, see that this is uh, the image which i show you in the next slide 
this is what was written beneath this slide okay um this detail and now you will understand this detail when like you know means we look at the figure but uh, the image which i have in the next slide it is out of this following reference if you want to read the article so on and so forth okay so this is what was written in that image which is a bar chart of region specific incidents age standardized rate okay so we have incidents of something it is standardized for age meaning age is controlled as a variable over here this is a confounding variable what is confounding you will be studying in the coming lectures but what you have to understand is that over here this is standardized for age um this bar chart is reporting incidents of something what is it reporting incidents of it is reporting incidents of cancer um of for lung so it is reporting incidents of lung cancer okay this is um you have data for both males and females okay so incidents of lung cancer among males and females standardized for age okay so i hope this makes sense now all right and age standardized rate are reported per 100000 person years you see the person years you know how um, i told you incidence you have two calculation incidence proportion and incidence rate so they have actually calculated the incidence rate because they have taken the year into account okay in what year the individuals developed lung cancer all right so they have done all of that backhand calculation all right so they have reported age standardized meaning controlled for age these are standardized rate uh, reported per 100000 uh, and person years and now you know what person year stands for okay and they have used direct method of calculation all right and the reference population is the world standard population okay so comparing it to the world population does that make sense guys okay so now i hope you can appreciate and you feel more confident that oh now i actually understand these terms which are reported in research papers or in governmental documents okay so this is my main intention that you can um understand when you look at these things in real life papers and research this is what epidemiology teaches you that you can understand what these things mean all right you are not bio statistician that you need to learn how to calculate all of these things but you do need to understand what these concepts are when are they used how are they used what what is the meaning behind them okay so now when we look at the figure which is in the next slide this is the um, say the interpretation of it let me just read it out for you and it it will make much more sense when we look at the figure all right so don't worry we'll get to the figure so the interpretation is after adjusting for age why do i say that because it is age standardized okay so after adjusting for age polynesian male and north american females and you will see that in the bar chart polynesian males and north uh, north american females had the highest incidence okay which is new cases now you know what incidence means All right of lung cancer and you know the incidence um what is reported is incidence rate okay ir all right person year all right the um the words that i have um yes highlighted in yellow which is over here um incidence um and then age standardized and direct method now you are um, able to interpret and understand them with much more confidence and this is the essence of this unit to help you to understand research with much more confidence because now you actually understand what it means and what it is trying to say the more further you advance in research you actually learn to do all of this in practice okay so you actually learn to calculate incidence um say standardized rates and so on and so forth okay all right but yes as a um say um application based subject right now what you have learned is how do you use this knowledge in interpreting research data okay so now let's interpret research data so for instance as i said that was the reference earlier and this is the graph which i have taken from that research paper now we have to interpret this research data okay so epidemiology this unit is teaching you application and practice now try to interpret this research data what did i say um polynesian say uh, now look at this first males females okay males are blue a uh, females are this purple color then we have age standardized incidence rate okay so these are your age standardized incidence rate reported per 100000 all right so um 80 per 100000 600000 so on and so forth so yes this is incidence age standardized incidence rate per 100000 males females over year these are all of the countries over year okay and this is compared to the world population standard which is not over year but it, that was the reference group world population standard so now you have for example uh, the polynesian males as we can see yes they have the highest um say incidence of lung cancer 
And now if you see from the percentage, you have 24% over here. Um, there is the North American, which we have said. North American, yes, 30%. So this is the highest. In all of the percentage, um, this is the highest. So in North American females, you have lung cancer rate, which is the highest. Does this make sense? Lung cancer rate among males is the highest. And lung cancer rate among uh, females is the highest in North American and in males, Polynesian, all right? And these are adjusted for age, okay? These figures, direct method of standardization is used. Incidence rate is reported at the backhand. They have actually seen in which year did these individuals develop lung cancer. So all of that calculation is what they have done, all right? And this is reported per 100,000. So I hope this makes sense, students, and this is much more meaningful now to you. All right, so I, I, this is what my intention is. In every um, say um, lecture, I want you to understand what is the real life um, use of this? Is what, what is the take home message from this? Okay, so that is what my main intention is. All right, so um, now please, you know how I said that the more advanced you go in epidemiology, and as I said, epidemiology and uh, statistics go hand in hand. And uh, there is a um, area of statistics, which is called as biostatistics, where you do much more advanced calculation than the basics one that have been taught to you, okay? One of the advanced calculation is to understand how you calculate the age standardized rates by direct method and indirect method. I will show you how you do that, okay? And there are many methods, again, students, you have to appreciate of calculating all of these variables that I have taught to you, incidence, proportion, mortality, so on and so forth. Okay, so there are various methods. I have used one method, the most simple method, which I thought could be helpful for you. Okay, so now the, um, now the way which I'm showing you how to calculate your direct and indirect methods of standardization, please appreciate. This is one of the many methods. Okay, so yes, please understand this is that blue slide which I was talking about. So this is not part of your um, say accessible items, but um, I'll be going through this so you can have an appreciation and an understanding of how this is taken. What is the backhand calculation of like, you know, producing a figure of something like this, okay? So just a, um, uh, I just want to show you an overview about this. And after uh, this slide, if you see, um, yes, this is an in an Excel sheet, I'll be showing you this calculation because it makes it much more easier direct and indirect method of standardization. That is what I have written in this slide. So that is okay. We will look at the Excel sheet shortly to understand how you do these calculation direct and indirect method of standardization. And I would strongly encourage you to go through these post readings. Some of your um, lectures may have post readings. So post readings are, for example, readings which will benefit your further knowledge and understanding about this unit, all right? And they are to be undertaken in your own time. I won't be going through them, uh, but they are again not assessed, but this is to just advance your understanding in epidemiology. What I truly believe is that um, at a postgraduate level, you don't need to take an assessment of every single item, but you need to provide sufficient knowledge to the students so that they can go further and they can do their extra readings and they can explore the unit further because postgraduate is all about taking a theoretical subject and understanding its application and practice. Epidemiology, I appreciate, is a very, very theoretical subject, a dry subject. So I'm trying to make it as um, interesting as possible for you. But please do review these post readings and you never know when some of this would be ap ap applicable for you in your research projects. Okay, so now what are these readings? Uh, these readings are to, you know, um, give you a insight into the practical applications of the crude, um, say, morbidity and mortality indicators which you have studied, all right? So you studied about, say, incidence, prevalence, death to case ratio, and things like that. So I've just given you a bit of a blurb on um, uh, where is this used, which ones are most commonly used, and in what, um, say, context are they used? So, you know, um, example, which I have given you throughout the lecture, for example, taking my meta-analysis example, this gives you a bit more broader scenario about the same, okay? So it is more about you understanding. So where do you apply these sort of variables, incidence, prevalence, and all those things? All right. So yes, I have uh, gone ahead with all of these kind of details again over here. 
Uh, over here, again, um, I have tried to um, give you an understanding that there are various methods of calculating this, and I have given you a references for the same, how they are used in various complicated modeling techniques. Okay, and um, yeah, PS. Yes. So basically, uh, that is what I wanted to share, that uh, there are various ways of using this in, um, say, research and in practice. So please have a read of um, these, say, slides. And in this, I've just given you an example of, say, you know how we took an example of age standardized um, incidence rate. Similarly, uh, to just give you an example of how infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate is calculated, IMR, MMR, and how it is graphed, and how, how is this interpreted. So basically, this will then give you an idea. Oh, okay, so um, you will have a better understanding of reading and interpreting this graph. So for example, this can be an accessible um, item, not this. But for example, when we have spoken about age standardized rate, the graph, so you can have a graph on some age standardized incidence of something or prevalence of something or mortality of something, and then you may be asked to interpret that graph. So the more research papers you read, the more uh, better understanding you will have of interpreting graphs and table. Of course, in your coming, um, say, lectures and cues, we also talk about interpreting graphs and tables, but basically, um, what is important in this subject is to understand real life data set rather than to go into the nitty gritties and get overwhelmed about how exactly was this IMR, MMR calculator or age standardized rate calculated. I hope you can understand, all right? So this is not a maths class. That's why the calculations are kept simple, but um, the application is much more. So how do you apply this in real life? If you have a research paper in front of you with this graph, how do you interpret this graph? Okay, that's why I have given you an explanation over here as to how this graph can be interpreted. That is why I spent um, so much more time in uh, say explaining to you, uh, for example, this graph so that you can get an understanding and an appreciation that something like this may come in your assessment. You have a graph and then you are given four options and then you are asked which um, say interpretation is most accurate for the graph or something like that. Okay, so this is um, helpful rather than asking you Calculate age standardized incidence rate, which really you are not going to do it a lot. This is uh, done generally by computers and by software. So you don't need to learn the hand calculations as such. Okay, so that is why um, rather than say bombarding you with the complicated calculations, my focus is um, for you to understand this in practice. Okay, so now the last slide is just an FYI slide again, global health indicators to show you what are the various global health indicators. All of these have their own calculations, which you don't have to worry about, but do understand um, what are the meaning of uh, these indicators. Global health indicators are used a lot in public health context. So for instance, if you were say majoring in public health, then we would have gone into the details of each and all of these indicators and we would have investigated them in detail, okay? But yes, in public health epidemiology, this is uh, widely used and that is where you would be studying it in detail. Uh, but yes, over here, you just need to have an overview about this, okay? And do remember blue slides, not part of assessments, okay? Yep, so now the slides are over. So let me take you to the Excel sheet, okay? So uh, let me now share with you the Excel sheet. Uh, just a minute, just bear with me. I'll share with you the Excel sheet, yeah. Okay, so I hope you can see the Excel sheet. Let me confirm I'm sharing the right thing. Yes, I'm sharing the right thing. Um, just a minute, yep, all is good, okay. So now again, this is just an FYI, this is to further your understanding. We'll look at how direct um, standardization, what is the calculation behind direct standardization? Then we'll look at the calculation behind indirect standardization. Remember for direct standardization, you have a reference group, okay? So now over here, for instance, um, the question is that we want to see the death rate, this is hypothetical, between country A and country B, okay? You want to compare the death rate between country A and country B and you have a reference population, which is country C, okay? So you have a reference population. That's why you're doing direct method of standardization. So um, students, this information is always given to you. Okay, so you know the age group, you know country A, number of deaths, all right, the crude deaths, 
then you know a uh, population age specific death rate per thousand all right you have this um, information as well and then basically you want to calculate observed age specific death rate per 100 person years okay so now you understand the concept of person years all right so what is the age specific death rate per 100 person years now wherever i have done a calculation i have written what calculation i have done and if you see over here um students this is where i have given the details of the calculation okay so what is b divided by c for instance so over here for instance if you have you have the row B2, for instance, this, which is B2 divided by C2. Okay, so when you divide this number by this number, you will get this. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is how I have got all of these three numbers. This green number over here is the same, which is this divided by this. Okay, so all of this is this uh, B divided B divided by C. Okay, so you have your Bs divided by your Cs, and then you have this number, which is your observed age specific death rate per um, 100 uh, per 100 person um, years. All right, then you have your uh, population, reference population. This is again given to you. That's why it is gray in color. Okay, so the gray in color is given to you, which is uh, what it is, a uh, population age specific death rate per 100 uh, per 1000. Then this is what is of your interest. These three columns, standardized rate, age adjusted death rates, and then age adjusted death rates per 1000. So you see how we are adjusting for age. Okay, because that is what our indicator is over your age group. So we are adjusting for this. So now how do you calculate this? So this is um, D into E. So what is your D column? Observed age specific death rate per 1000 uh, person years. So it is this number and it is into this number. Okay. And then you get your standardized rates. All right. So this is D2 into E2. Similarly, you do for this. Similarly, you do for this row as well. Now, this is an addition of all. Please remember, okay, it is not in twos, all right? When you add all of this up, you get your standardized rate, okay? The overall standardized rate, all right? Now, you want age-adjusted death rate, okay? So, that is your F divided by E. What is your F? Your F is this, and you are dividing it by E. What is your E? E is over here, okay? So, this one. These two are of your interest, variables of your interest. And then you have F divided by E over here. If you see F5 divided by E5, which is your F5 is this, your E5 is this number, all right? When you divide this by this, you get this number. Does that make sense, all right? And this is your um, age adjusted death rate, which is just in 2000. As you know, if you want to report it per thousand, you just have to multiply it by thousand, okay? So yes, multiply it by thousand and you get this. So how do you interpret this um, in written statement? It is observed age specific death rate per hundred person uh, per uh, per thousand person years. Um, no, hang on. Oh, sorry. This is the formula which I have given you for all of these. Sorry, I got confused. Okay, so yep. So your uh, what is your B divided by C? That is your um, observed um, age specific death. D um, into E is your standardized rate, and your age adjusted death rate is F into E, uh, F divided by E. Okay. So yes. Basically, your um, say age adjusted death rate per um, thousand is um, say 7.09 for country A. Okay, because we are um, looking at age adjusted death rates for country A. So for country A, the age adjusted death rates are 7.09 per thousand. All right. Does that make sense? Then you do the same exact thing for country B. So again, these three columns are generally given to you. Then you have your observed age specific. You use the same thing as I said, okay? Your B divided by Cs. Then this is again given to you, the reference population, country C. Okay, then these are the three things are of your interest. It is the same thing again. This is multiplication of your Ds and your Es. This one is the addition of the final one. Then this is your F divided by E, this number, and your age adjusted death rate per thousand over here is 9.59, okay? So now your age adjusted death rate for your country B is 9.59, for country A is 7.09. So which one has a higher age adjusted death rate? Country B, right? Okay. And then you calculate the comparative mortality ratio. What is comparative mortality ratio? The ratio which you get after dividing this uh, number and this number, age adjusted death rates for both of the countries. 
Okay, so it is a simple thing, big number my, divided by small number. So your nine point, uh, say that five one divided by your seven point zero nine, this number, and then you get one point three five. Okay, so one point three five per thousand higher age adjusted death rates for country B than country A. Okay, so country B has higher death rate. All right, so this is what it means. So country B has one point three five times higher age adjusted deaths uh, than country A. Okay, so now over here, so uh, basically what um, it means in a much more detailed descriptive terms, after controlling for the confounding effects of age, the age adjusted death rates among country B is 35% higher than country A. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. And uh, guys, all of these uh, blue things are all of the mini calculations which I have shown you and I'll show you where do they come from. So now, for instance, why are um, the importance or the application of having age-adjusted numbers? Why are these important? Okay, so now if you look at this, all right, so uh, we are just looking at the crude numbers over here. Okay, so for instance, now you have your crude number, which you have over here, 0 0.0105. Okay, so now where does this come from? If you look at this, I've highlighted it for you. Okay, so this is observed age specific death rate per thousand person years. All right. So this number comes over here and then into thousand person years. So you have 10.5 per thousand person years, then country B. So I've done the same thing with country B. If you see this 0 0.007, this number has come from here. Okay, and into thousand is what I have done. So if you see the crude mortality rate. Okay, so I've just calculated the simple crude mortality rate. It is not adjusted for age, all right? It is just age-specific death rate. It is not, um, say, um, it's just, um, yeah, age-specific death rate. It is not adjusted for age. That's why it is a crude mortality rate, death rate. Okay, so the crude mortality rate, if you look at the um, detailed description over here, crude mortality rate higher for country A, which is your 10.5%, this is where it comes from, then country B, okay, and what is your country B? 7.1, this is where I got my 7.1, but now you know the calculation. So I have calculated crude mortality rate. You know how I told you that um, um, you may have, say, um, certain such, say, complicated tables in which you may be asked to calculate crude mortality rates. This is an example for the same, okay? So over here, the crude mortality rate is calculated by um, so by, um, as I said over here, uh, which is what you have, this in 2000 and uh, your, this observed age specific death rate in 2000, okay? So you see the crude mortality rate for country A is higher than country B, 10%, I'm just um, saying it in a roundup number. So 10% versus 7%, okay? So the crude mortality rate higher for country A versus country B. But what did we see after age adjustment? is that country B had a much higher uh, age adjusted death rate versus country A, all right? Therefore, crude mortality rate, not accurate representation because after controlling for age, country A had lower mortality rate than country B, which is 7% versus 9%. Does that make sense, students? Why this is of importance, adjusting for age, okay? And why is this the case? Why is it that the scenario has flipped? The scenario has become completely inverse after controlling for age. It is because country A has less younger people dying than country B, okay? And what do I mean by less younger people dying? Look at these blue things which I have shown you, okay? So for instance, the youngest group is zero to 29 years of age, okay? So you have so many people dying in country A and you have so many people dying in country B. Now calculate what is the proportion of younger people dying from the total population, okay? So it is just a cross calculation. If you don't understand that, I have even done that for you over here. This is your cross calculation, okay? So this is your total population and uh, these are the younger people in that population, which is 42%. So uh, for instance, country A has 42% of younger people dying, okay? Uh, if you look at country B, you do the same thing total population, and then you have the younger people population, which is 69%. So you have so many more, say, uh, younger people dying in country B. Country A has less people of younger people dying, okay? That is why if you just look at crude number, it looks like, oh, 
um, so many people are di dying in um, country A, but that is not the real life scenario. If you adjust for age, if you adjusted for a person being young or old, then you have more people dying in country A, which is a true representation of the death rate. Does that make sense, students? So I hope this is helpful. Okay, so I've just over here, I've shown you a comparison. All right, so over here you had your, uh, this were the death rates and these were your crude ones. All right, and now you have these adjusted ones. Now you know exactly why age adjusted ones are of so much more importance because after adjustment for age, people being young or old, the overall mortality was much more higher in country B compared to country A, okay? So yes, this is how you calculate your direct method of standardization. And as you have seen, even crude mortality rate, you can calculate using complicated tables like this. Okay, and these are your age adjusted mortality rates. Okay, age uh, adjusted or age standardized mortality rates. This is the direct method in which you need the reference population, hypothetical population over here being country C. Okay, now you have the indirect method of standardization. Okay, as you remember, indirect method of standardization used when you do not have a reference population. Okay, so you have to make one of the population your reference. All right, so now for instance, Again, this information is always given to you. Age group, number of deaths, and then population age specific deaths. All right, per thousand. So that is given to you. Then over here, for instance, see this blue color. Uh, please make note of this blue color. Okay, why have I made this blue color? Because these same numbers are over here. Why? Because over here, your country A is your reference. You have made your country A the reference population because you do not have a reference group. You have to make something a reference group for a calculating standardizations rate. And over here, country A is your reference group. Okay? So your observed age-specific death rate per um, a thousand person years. So again, B divided, B divided by C. So this is the same thing which you did. What was it? Your B divided by C. Okay? So if you see over here in direct, if you remember, we did the same thing, okay, which is your B divided by C, okay? So 0 0.0011, 0 0.0011, okay? So it's the same numbers, okay? So that's what I wanted to tell you that don't be scared. It's the same numbers. You divide everything, B divided by C. This is what you get, okay? Then over here, as it suggests, this is C into D. So what is your C column? Age specific death rate, all right, per thousand, and you multiply this by your observed age specific death rate, okay? And then you get these numbers. Again, this, as you know, is a summation of these yellow items, okay? All right, and then the last one, your standardized mortality ratio, okay? Which is your SMR. It is a ratio, standardized mortality ratio, which is your B. What is your B? Just number of deaths, all right? In country A divided by E. What is this expected death rate? Okay, so your B's divided by your E's will give you this, which is one in this case, all right? So I hope this is clear. And this is again the detailed, um, say, um, just the detailed explanation of what is B divided by C. I've just given the details over here. Now, again, you do the exact same thing over here. These three things will but obviously be given to you. Over here, country A is your reference. So for observed age specific death rate per um, thousand person years, you use the same numbers over here as your reference numbers, okay? And then you do the same thing and your B divided by C over here is not this B divided by C, okay? It comes from this one, all right? So if you want, I can delete it from here to make it easier for you. This is just a copy paste from here to here, okay? That's it, nothing else which I've done. All right, now this, of course, you have to do C, C into D, which is the same thing. So you have your Cs into your Ds, Okay, this is what it gives you. This is again the summation of these three numbers, all right? And again, this is a ratio, standardized mortality ratio. So which is your B, what was your B? Just your number of uh, deaths in the country divided by E, which is your expected death rate. And this is the number you get, all right? Again, comparative standardized mortality ratio is again um, dividing these two numbers, all right? So uh, one and this 1.60, big number divided by small number again. And of course you're dividing it by one, so it's not rocket science. So you have 1.6, all right? So how do, how is this interpreted? That 1.6 per thousand higher age adjusted death rates for country B than country A, okay? 
if you see over here also you have country b which has higher death rates over here what we saw again country b had higher um death rates okay but if you see how the numbers are different over here it was 1.35 comparative mortality ratio all right over here our comparative standardized this standardized mortality ratio is 1.6 you see this is how the calculations may differ if you have a reference group versus you don't have a reference group and you are doing work within the population which you have all right uh, can you argue if this is an overestimation very difficult to say you will have to see this within the context of the work that you are doing okay so i cannot just answer it blankly that no direct indirect method is overestimating things it is not a blank rule that it is always overestimating things it depends upon the type of uh, research question you have and the type of population that you are studying okay so yes um, after controlling for confounding effects of age the age adjusted death rates among country b is 60% higher than country a okay uh, but yes for instance if you do have in this specific example in this hypothetical example um if you have a reference population then yes i feel this would be much more accurate number of representation than this and yes of course the ideal thumb rule is if you have a reference population do direct method of standardization and of course if you have a considerable sample size but if those conditions are not met that is when an, an individual prefers indirect method if we saw the example in the powerpoint presentation um regarding um the um say uh, lung cancer um incidence rate direct method of standardization was used right because they compared it to the world population so yes if you look at the national international big data sets the most preferred method of working is using direct method of standardization because larger the sample size less risk you have for the type 1 type 2 errors which you will be covering in the future on lectures future meaning not that much future okay so um Yes, this is just a um, reference from where I have taken this example because I found this um, to be as simple as possible to explain. But um, yes, students, as I said, this is advanced level learning. But I hope you can appreciate the background uh, calculations which are done to produce those kind of graphs and figures. Okay, which you just um, saw right now. But yes, I hope this has been helpful for you, and I hope um, lecture one has been. Um, you can digest it is digestible i hope it's not been overwhelming and um, as i said uh, we have a lot of theory to cover in epidemiology which we will be doing in the coming lectures but yes you do have a lot of um, not a lot, lot of but you do have specific lectures which have a uh, certain calculations which are of importance for you to know which will be which we will be looking at throughout but um, yes i hope this has not been a scary experience for you your lecture one and yes um, i'll meet you shortly in your tutes thank you thank you for your time